It was clear that we weren't welcome. Men and women with dull, hostile expressions watched us walk by. Most of them had tattoos all over their bodies, including their faces. Almost everyone we passed had golfed, golf ball size wads of tobacco or something stuffed in their cheeks. Many of them spit strings of brown juice when we walked by. Don't pay attention, Fred said. It's just their way. We came to a stop outside a lean-to built next to a tree. Raul, Fred shouted, adding something in Portuguese. He don't speak any English and only a little Portuguese. Raul crawled out of a lean-to and sat on his haunches, looking up at us. His right eye was swollen and shut. He didn't seem to recognize me. Like the other Indians, he had black tattoos on his arms and face. On either side of his upper lip, he had three tattooed lines that looked like cat whiskers. Two young girls, no more than six or seven years old, peeked at us from behind the tree the lean-to was against. A couple of people sauntered over to see what was going on. They were soon joined by several others. Tell him that I would like his help catching the jaguar, Doc said. Tell him I won't kill the jaguar. I'll use a drug to make the cat go to sleep. When the jaguar wakes up, I'll let him go someplace a long way away from here. It will be safe. That's a mouthful, Fred said, picking at his beard and looking at his wrist. I'll give you more money when we leave, Doc told him. Fred pantomimed as he talked to make sure that rule understood. Fred seemed to have some difficulty explaining the tranquilizing and waking up part, but managed to get through it. Raul watched him impassively. A couple of times he glanced at Doc and me. Fred finally came to the end of his speech. Raul stared off into the distance. We waited for what seemed like a long time. No one said anything. Even the spitting stopped. Raul turned his head towards Doc and said something. He then called one of the girls out from behind the tree and whispered in her ear. She and her friend ran off giggling. Fred shook his head. He said no. Are you sure you explained it right to him? Clear as a bell. He doesn't want to help you. We better go. Doc didn't want to leave. Tell him that the jaguar will die unless he lets me tranquilize it. I already did that, Fred insisted. Do it again. Fred rolled his eyes, then said a few more words. Roel shook his head, then climbed back into his lean-to. Sorry, Fred said, but I still get my money. <clears throat> You'll get it. We walked back through the camp. The spitting started up again, and people began murmuring things and snickering as we passed. I felt very uncomfortable. The Indians probably had the same feeling every day as they walked through the mining town on their way to the gold pit. When we got back to the town, Doc gave Fred a $5 bill. You sure you don't need any help on your boat? Fred asked. I'd sure like to get out of here. I'm afraid not. Oh well, Fred said. Maybe I got the weight right on this cat. You never know. It's just as well you didn't get that jaguar. Catching it alive wouldn't set well with most of the people around here. Doc and I headed to the trail leading to the docks. About halfway down, we heard someone shouting behind us. It was the two little girls that had been with Raul. They ran up to us. One of them had her hair, I'm sorry, one of them had her hands behind her back. She brought one hand forward and presented me with a piece of string. What's this? She brought her other hand forward and released a large metallic blue butterfly. It was beautiful. Two, the two girls giggled and ran back to the path. Doc and I watched the butterfly flutter back and forth, trying to get free. Morpho butterfly, Doc said. I reached into my pocket with my free hand and took out my pocket knife. Doc helped me cut the string, and the Morpho danced away into what was left of the forest. <clears throat>